So, well, basically, I think what we did over the last number of sessions when we are looking at this book by Swami Shankar, <laughs> sorry, um, everything, uh, consciousness is everything. But that um, book, what we tried to do is, I think we first just looked at some of the key concepts and principles of the philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism. We also touched upon uh, some of the history of how Kashmir Shaivism evolved. Because that was a little scattered in his first five, six chapters. We looked at some videos. <coughs> Sorry, I seem to have suddenly developed some slight throat irritation. If it doesn't go, I'll just get a glass of warm water. Uh, but uh, so these are the things. Now, um, when we come to the introduction to Kashmir Shaivism, he begins by saying that Kashmir Shaivism is the study of consciousness. And since consciousness is infinite, our study will also be infinite. And to elaborate a little further, he relates one anecdote at one of his first uh, meetings with his gurus and with other students from the West, where this uh, friend of his was very upset because his dog was not allowed into the ashram. There were no pets allowed. So he was very furious and he says to Shankar, what is this? After all, my dog is a human being, is human consciousness in a dog's body. So Shankar says, Richard, so are we all. The dog is limited by his dog's body and his dog's limited consciousness. And we are also absolute consciousness, but we are limited by our own jealousies, our own narrow view of things, our own uh, petty and our own ignorance and so on. So basic, the first sort of principle in Kashmir Shaivism is like completely overarching. And as he says, you know, um, the very first Shiva Sutra, which is just one short line. The sutras are usually just short lines, like aphorisms, you know. And uh, they are deliberately left away for two, three reasons. First of all, by being short and, you know, succinct, uh, they could be easily transmitted orally, where writing and publishing was not possible. Uh, secondly, it left the actual meaning and the inner meaning and the various levels of meaning uh, open to the guru who is going to teach you those sutras. So his first, uh, this thing is that uh, Chaityanam help me out, Billy. What is the Chaityanam, Shiv? Uh, but I don't have the text right now. Okay, okay. I think I have it here. One second. Okay. Chaityanam Atma. Chaitanya. Everything is consciousness. Atma, consciousness. Now, to, okay, so we'll come to each of these three propositions, one by one again, but let me just enumerate the three, which of course we saw later is referred to as the Trika system. So the first is this, that everything is consciousness. The second is that this entire world and everything that we see in the world, including us and our limited consciousness, and everything about us and the world and material, uh, physical objects and mental objects, everything is just a contraction or condensation of the absolute consciousness, which is referred to as Shiva. And you can say it's a condensation, it's a contraction, it's a sort of conception of the energy of that absolute consciousness which has been labeled as Shakti, the feminine aspect, though it's not masculine and feminine, it's not, it's more like yin yang or two, two together, two but not two, that sort of thing. And so therefore the whole world is the real and is a manifestation or condensation or reflection of the absolute consciousness of Shiva. And the third proposition is, that because of this contraction, because of the contraction of that absolute consciousness, 
into our limited consciousness, which we call jiva, we have we are immersed in that ignorance, not realizing that we are that absolute and true consciousness, which you can call God or whatever. And therefore, the 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 aim of Kashmir Shaivism yoga practice understanding is to recognize this ignorance, to recognize our true self, and to take the movement back. We have sort of moved away. We have got condensed, contracted. Now is the time to expand and evolve and go back and become one with that absolute consciousness, to recognize that. And uh, so he, he quotes a very nice couple of examples about this whole business of recognition. You know, So he gives the example of a, a little incident in a play uh, which was written by UNESCO. UNESCO, Eugene UNESCO, he was one of the founders of the Theatre of the Absurd. And uh, in this play called The Bald Soprano, it seems, there is this scene where a man and a woman meet at a party. And they start talking at like a cocktail party. Oh, so where do you stay? I stay in this city. Oh, you stay? Even I stay here. Uh, which <laughs> suburb? Which area? Oh, they say, oh, even I stay there. Are they? Uh, which, which building? Oh, this building. Oh, I also stay in the same building. Which floor? Third floor. I'm also on the third floor. <laughs> What is your flat number? Whatever, 27B. I'm in 27B. You must be my wife. And she says, oh, darling. And they embrace and hug each other. And the audience bursts into applause and laughter. So you know something, but you don't recognize it. So we may know intellectually through all this reading and study that we are absolute consciousness. We are also Shiva. But we don't recognize it. So there is no direct recognition. And here's another example of a girl who fell in love with her pen pal, whom she had never seen, because he loved, she loved his compassion and his wide reading and everything. And she confides in this girl, if I knew who, who he was, I would marry him straight away. So the girl says, what's his name? You found, must know his name at least. He said, yeah, this one. He said, Are you know him? He said, what do you mean I know him? Are, he's the guy who sells us vegetables in the market every day when both of us go for our groceries. So she says, oh, that guy. So the friendship develops. She recognizes now the pen pal she knew, but she had not recognized and happily ever after and so on. So now let us look at these three propositions a little bit in detail. Uh, so first is about consciousness being everything. Uh, everything is consciousness. Consciousness is everything. So now uh, what... Uh, author gets into is a uh, parallel with physics. And he says that now today physics has acknowledged that the substratum of the material world is energy. We have gone through this in detail some time back that matter is nothing but condensed energy. Everything is made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, elementary. Everything is made of the same thing. It's just that energy is sort of fluid, you can say, moves, goes from place to place, transmits from one medium to another, and matter is sort of condensed. But he is saying that what Kashmir Shaivism asks is, who is the one who observes this condensation of matter and energy? And he says that's our consciousness. So it is consciousness that is observing this. He goes a little bit into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, saying that, well, you know, the very fact that there is an observer changes the observation and so on. But we didn't go into that. That's not that important here. The important thing here is that what he is saying is, whereas neurosciences and even Darwinian evolution has not found any definite answer how is it that a complex arrangement of the same proton, neutron, electrons in a very complex manner in the human brain with a lot of electrical and chemical interactions, how does it give rise to consciousness? So the scientific so-called materialist view is that a complex organization of energy matter, now we will not say energy or matter, energy dash matter, a complex organization of that 
gives rise to consciousness. In say Madhyamika, you would say that consciousness is a separate mind stream and is beginningless. Though the physical body may, you know, after every lifetime be destroyed and some of the elements may be recycled, but consciousness continues as a separate mainstream. And when it joins up with the new physical body, rebirth takes place. But it still doesn't explain where does this causeless chain of causation come? Where does this beginningless consciousness come from? If it is not arising from energy and matter, and so on, there are many questions unanswered. Even Darwinian evolution, he explains, does not have any satisfying answer and they don't really want to go there. Because natural selection and all that can explain how, you know, simple amino acids can become complex proteins, how complex proteins can develop, you know, specialized organs in certain multi-organ uh, beings. And then you have the human being. But what combination... What complex arrangement of amino acids can give rise to consciousness? So he says that, I mean, he doesn't use that word, but I would say he sort of turns this whole thing on its head. And he says that, in fact, the substratum, the foundation of the universe, everything is consciousness. And manner, mat energy, matter, our limited consciousness, everything is a condensation of from that consciousness. Just as in this part of that universe, matter is a condensation of energy. This energy dash matter is a condensation of absolute consciousness. Our individualized consciousnesses, my consciousness, Billings consciousness, is also a contraction of that absolute consciousness. And that absolute consciousness in Kashmir Shaivism, they call Shiva. As though distinguished from Shiva, the deity who, who appears in the legends and the myths and in the uh, and in you know the Puranas and so on. So, because that will bring us to the dualistic Shaivism. Uh, we'll see that a bit later. So here basically he's saying that, so now that absolute consciousness is Shiva, you call it God, but and that brings us to the second proposition. What is this contraction? Then? Now, again, uh, some people say like, I mean, some, some terms used are, it's a manifestation, it's a reflection, it's the activity of the energy of the Shakti of the Absolute Consciousness Shiva. One one metaphor I found useful from these Times of India articles was the one about the mirror. <laughs> so, of course, like all metaphors, it will break down if we take it to an extreme. And like all metaphors, it cannot explain the entire complex uh, philosophy. It is only to illustrate one aspect of the philosophy. And, sorry. Huh. So, uh, the 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 metaphor or the example give similar simile given is if you are standing before a mirror now you are the subject and the mirror is reflecting you you see the image in the mirror now uh, let's say say that you take a stone and you throw it at the mirror and the mirror cracks into a hundred pieces some of them keep stuck onto that same board on which the mirror was, some fall down. And now you have broken images of yourself, 100 images, and so on. Now, the question is, if Shiva is reflected in the broken world, in that contracted world, the stone being thrown by his own free will, does anything make that pure consciousness impure? That world which is reflected is completely shattered. It's a broken world. In one piece of mirror, you'll just see the head. In one piece of mirror at the bottom, you'll just see the foot of the subject. Some you will not see at all. Those pieces have fallen on the floor and they will reflect what's on the ceiling. But despite all this chaos of the reflected world, 
the absolute pure consciousness is not affected. It remains pure. It remains absolute consciousness. Now, if you take the metaphor a little further, it breaks down but also explains a little further. Everything is consciousness. That means the room in which the mirror is, the stand or the cupboard on which the mirror is fixed, the mirror itself is contraction of that absolute consciousness. So in fact, there is no mirror. There is no mirror. That which is a condom, which we call a mirror, which is a contraction of the absolute consciousness, is reflecting that which we call the world, which is reflecting that which we call a stone, which is also consciousness of Shiva, which all interact to break up the world that was manifested by that same consciousness who was standing before the mirror, where there was no mirror. Little complex, but it's a little easier to understand this way than to just say, oh, you know, free will, God created the world and you can draw it back. Mirror is a good example. Hmm. I thought it was a good example. Now, so, of course, here also there are assumptions. It's not that you can say, oh, now it's proved. It is proved that consciousness is the structure. It's not, nothing is proved here. It's just that this seems to be a neater hypothesis as compared to other things like causeless chain of causation or consciousness arising out of matter and complexity of matter and electrical interactions. It explains things like memory. It might explain also, you know, this whole idea of recognition and, uh, and also this idea of Shakti as a feminine energy, which is energy which, which the absolute consciousness does display. So everything is seen as a play of consciousness. So this entire world is a play of consciousness of that absolute consciousness. And therefore, it contrasts with the view both of Madhyamika and Vedanta that the world is maya and an illusion. The world, according to Kashmir Shaivism, is very, very real because it is nothing but the contraction of that absolute consciousness. Unless you say the absolute consciousness is not real and that's, you know, just a, just a figment of somebody's imagination. But imagination whose? Which imagination of whose consciousness? You, you never get an answer then. So if that consciousness is real and the very word absolute sort of hints at the reality of that consciousness, then the world which it manifests, reflects, creates, energizes, whatever, will also be real. So the world is not something to be shunned, shunned and, you know, escaped from. The world is something to be lived in, but <coughs> with the understanding that we have to recognize and move away from the distractions of the world. So, yes, all, all three, Vedanta, Madhyamika and Kashmir Shaivism say that ignorance is the root. Ignorance is the root of suffering. But the nature of that ignorance is slightly different in each. In Vedanta, they will say the ignorance is that you think the world is real. Actually, there is only Brahman. But Brahman doesn't act. Brahman is passive. And we are all like, just like Shaivism, we are all part of that Brahman. And when we recognize that, and we realize that the world arises out of illusion, then suffering will cease. Because then in order to evolve, okay, we'll come to that, that's a second step, what to do with the suffering. Uh, Madhyamika will say, your ignorance is about the nature of your true self. You think you truly exist. You think other phenomena truly exist. Actually, they're all marked by emptiness of any inherent existence. So your ignorance is about the emptiness of that phenomena. And if you could do away with that, then you would know that there is no intrinsic table, there is no intrinsic chair, there is no intrinsic aspi also. So that is the nature of the ignorance. And in Kashmir Shaivism, say that the nature of the ignorance is you have forgotten. You are ignorant of the fact that you are Shiva, that you are the absolute consciousness. And you are in the real world. There is no illusion about it. You are in the real world and you are suffering. You are suffering because you are... <coughs> Vision is extremely limited. You do not have the will 
you feel a certain missing something missing you want to unite with something which you have once been united with you cannot put your finger on that you cannot name that so you may have that will you do not have the or knowledge you have knowledge but your mind is limited so your knowledge is limited you do not have the energy to do anything of the whole thing so on all three grounds on yeah. willfulness knowledge and energy you find yourself inadequate and that causes suffering and similarly now to get out of suffering <coughs> vedanta will say you have to recognize <coughs> the illusory nature of the world and reject it renounce it and get out of it Kashmir Shaivism on the other side, no, no, the world is real. There's nothing to renounce. You have to live in it, live properly. And how do you move away? How do you get away from suffering? You get away from suffering by doing all those things, mental, physical, spiritual, yoga, whatever, that brings you closer to the recognition of absolute consciousness. In a sense, that brings you closer to God or to knowledge of God. And shun all those things which take you away from God. As P, is the word God relevant? If, see, he's writing this book for a mainly Western audience and English-speaking audience. So sometimes he does slip into the word God just to emphasize the fact that from the Kashmir Shaivism point of view, Shiva, God, Absolute Consciousness are all interchangeable names for that concept, concept which more scientifically, he most of the time talks of absolute consciousness. <coughs> because <coughs> Shiva can be confused with the deity Shiva, the guy on Mount Kailash, you know, with the cobra around his neck and the trishul and all that, and whom you worship and who does things for you and whom you put a coconut for and all that, and whose name you recite whole night on Mahashivaratri. God you could confuse with the Abrahamic ideas of God <laughs> as a paternal figure and so on. God, who art in heaven, that sort of thing. So, but he does use it here and there, I think, as a sort of a sort of a tip of the hat to the Western world, you know. So <laughs> I wonder so if consciousness is... can be closer to the Holy Spirit. Possibly, yeah, 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 yeah. Probably, you know, rather than God, the Trinity may not. Be. Actually, in the Tibetan book of Living and Dying, Sogyal Rinpoche, again, he was writing for a mainly Western audience. He says that the three bodies of the Buddha, Dharmakaya, Sambhokaya, and Nirmankaya, can be taught in terms of. Father, Son, and Holy Son Spirit. And Holy Spirit. You see. Hmm. But it's a little tenuous. Father, Son, I and mean, Holy it's Spirit like itself is very complicated to understand it. if you are not familiar with Christian theology. And there itself, there are so many versions of it over the centuries. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a little gratuitous to use such sort of comparisons and metaphors. But you may be right that Holy Spirit might make it a spirit that moves, you know, on the face of the earth or whatever, you know. Uh, but what is clear here is <clears throat> the Shiva of Kashmiri Shaivism has nothing to do with the mythical Shiva. No, not nothing to do. It's like saying that Shakyamuni Buddha, we cannot say has nothing to do with the enlightenment of all the Buddhas from time immemorial. He is the embodiment of that enlightenment. So for common people, <coughs> even Vedanta, if you ask a normal, conservative, ordinary Hindu also, but little educated person, he will probably say, yes, yes, there is only one God, you know. And of course, we say 33,000 God, but there is only one God. These are the personifications of certain qualities of that God. You know, one is the one who removes obstacles. One is the one who gives you, you know, good health. One gives you wealth. One gives you knowledge. These are all the attributes of God, that one God only. But when we worship, yeah, we also worship these attributes, you know, that sort of thing. So, does it feel like uh, I mean, Shakyamuni Buddha and Christ have the, the dubious distinction of being historical also? Uh, apart from Shankara, is a really mythical deity. 
so you are comparing mm -hmm. one mythical shankar uh, is a shiva uh, shiva shiva is in the one who resides uh, in kailasa is uh, at once uh, mythical and uh, uh, hence easier to equate with co the higher consciousness of also, yeah, of course. rather than yeah. buddha with yeah. dharmakaya because uh, Buddha is also no, no. historical. No, I'm, okay. Maybe Buddha was the wrong example, but what about uh, our Lokiteshwara? What about ah, Tara? Yeah, yeah. Correct. Correct. When you say that, so always, you know, every every new student will ask Rinpoche. I mean, I'm saying any Rinpoche who is teaching, you know, uh, does Tara really exist? And nine out of ten times the answer is, well, do you really exist? If you exist, then Tara also exists. If you don't really exist, then Tara doesn't exist. Now, this is a clever way of not answering anything. But it makes some sense, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but we can also argue that mm. uh, uh, the uh, consciousness of Kashmiri Shaivism has nothing to do with the mythical Shiva. We can also argue that. Yeah, that we, it could argue, we would have very little evidence in any this way or that to argue it through. I mean, there is no archaeological, historical evidence which we could say. And then, of course, the counter argument, the absence of evidence doesn't mean it wasn't happened. It didn't happen. See, the mythical Shiva, you know, there is a lot of folklore, you know, mythical folklore. Yeah. Around him. There's a whole Shiva Puran. And, you know, yeah. yeah, so all that does, you know, uh, the Consciousness we are talking about is not concerned with all that. Yeah. yeah. So the consciousness that we are talking about in the area which we are studying, namely Kashmir Shaivism, is, you may be right, it's not concerned with that. But we cannot ignore that there is Shaivism and there is Shaktism, which is dualistic. Kashmir Shaivism, by and large, is a non dualistic system like Madhyamika perhaps, but and it's also Vedanta. Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta is definitely a non-dualistic system. We are Brahman, we are Shiva, absolute consciousness. Uh, we are, okay, empty of any inherent existence. Or we are the Dharmakaya, primal Buddhas. We have Buddha nature. Now, that, that, so maybe that's the next part I was coming to, that we also, besides studying these three principles, so one, let's summarize. One is that absolute consciousness, consciousness is everything and therefore the world is real and the suffering is because of our limited, our ignorance about the nature of our true self. <coughs> and as long as we keep operating in this world, ignoring the reality of the world, ignoring our true self, we are creating more and more causes and conditions. So there it will completely accord with Madhyamika. You are in ignorance, you are creating more and more causes and conditions, you will keep on getting reborn in this broken world. Till one day Shiva decides to withdraw his maybe 33 million years ahead or light years ahead, whatever. But right now, you will keep on taking rebirth. That we are a contraction. <laughs> and lastly, we have to all our purpose, our sadhana, our yoga, our study, our philosophy should be geared to us recognizing our true nature as being condensation of that consciousness and moving towards that. And then being sort of immersed in the joy and bliss of realizing I am Shiva. Where everything becomes peripheral. Your suffering, your pain and pleasure and everything becomes peripheral. Once you experience that bliss. So, what I said in the beginning, we also did study a little bit of the historical origins of, of Kashmir Shaivism. And that may clear up some of this confusion. Not confusion, but this sort of aspects which of what is Shiva and what is not Shiva. So, I'll share that same diagram which I had shared last time. Uh, uh, this... Ask me just one question. Yeah, sure. Go this, on. this pure bliss which you you get through uh, being fully aware of this consciousness. Mm -hmm. Is that something which is intermittent 
you know, where you kind of go back and forth, you get it sometimes, and sometimes you are in the condensed version. The Is it a kind of back and forth, or is it a kind of permanent state? I would not venture to answer, but from what our reading of other spiritual traditions, even enlightenment and so on, that it begins with some sort of intermittent glimpses of that. And then you lose it. I mean, you're meditating and you think you're one with everything. You get up from the cushion, suddenly you lost it. You're no longer one with everything. It is very, very rare that you reach the enlightenment of the Buddha, where you don't anymore, Buddha doesn't need to meditate anymore. He's constantly in that dual listing. Total wisdom of reality and total compassion to act in the world also. To act in the world with the wisdom that the world doesn't really exist. I mean, in itself inherently. So I think it probably would begin intermittently. And if you are lucky, maybe <laughs> if it's your karma or whatever. So let's go back to a little bit to the history and then we'll just throw it open for discussion. <clears throat> So oh, yeah, this was the hmm. so now again this is a very very rough outline culled from the videos I saw and some of the writings in this book itself. <laughs> Hinduism is in inverted commas for obvious reasons that Hindu scriptures, whatever we call Hinduism today. Because even people, the Kashmir Shaivism, yeah, yeah, branch of Hinduism. Everybody would say that. Uh, so basically, the scriptural sources, that's what I'll call this diagram. Scriptural sources of uh, both Vedic and non-Vedic schools. First of all, a little, these two are there. Vedic school and non-Vedics outside of the Vedas. However, some people do posit a third branch. And these are the renunciants, the Shravakas, people like Buddha, Mahavir, who rejected the Vedas, <coughs> who didn't, who were not in the lineage. I mean, they were much earlier. This is 9th century. Outside of the Vedas, Agamas, Tantras, Tantras definitely are 9th century onwards, 9th century AD. Whereas uh, the renunciants were 500 BC, 600 BC, and so on. But they do say that that's a third branch. <laughs> We developed its own scriptures, its own philosophy. Buddhism, Jainism, and all those other renunciant uh, sects and schools. Not to mention the uh, atheistic, materialistic schools and so on. But broad divisions are... So whatever is in blue is Vedic. Whatever is in red is outside of the Vedas, Agamas and Tantras. And whatever is dualistic, I have put in green. And what is non-dualistic, again, in red. So, based on the Vedas, includes Upanishads. They are supposed to have come from a divine source. <laughs> the sages heard it directly from the gods. So, they are called Shruti, heard from the gods. And what is written down years later, or recited from generation to generation, Smriti, what is remembered. And these Vedic schools, which are mainly Vaishnava, not Shiva, though Shiva also figures, <coughs> also over the centuries developed other texts. So there is Vishnu Puran, Shiv Puran, whatever, various gods. Now, in the non dualistic part, you have Advaita Vedanta and Vishishta Advaita. So Advaita Vedanta, of course, the main proponent was Shankara, whereas in Vishishta Advaita was Ramanuja, <coughs> who posited a qualified non-duality. How qualified non-duality? He too rejects Maya and he says the world is real. But it is non-dualistic in that this real world and the reality, which is Brahman, are one. They are non-dual. It's a non-dual uh, organization between these two. Whereas Shankara's thing was, world is Maya. It is doesn't really exist. And 
again based on the vedas itself you had the dualistic schools of vedic hinduism uh, madhava was one example from karnatak and many others and your entire bhakti schools bhakti schools based on the bhakt of bhakti of krishna and all the avatars of vishnu and the various goddesses of the vishnu of the, of the various purans would come on this dualistic branch of that now around the 9th century ad the shiva sutras emerged but many centuries before that there were scriptures which were called the agamas so the agamas and tantras agamas slowly evolved into the tantras and they were both in sanskrit and tamil in once again there were dualistic schools and there were non dualistic schools within kashmir shaivism but today when we talk of kashmir shaivism it mainly refers to non the non dualistic aspect of kashmir shaivism and the dualistic will simply be referred to as shaivism that is taking god as that they shall shiva as that deity and in the second and third century so this see tantras come in the 9th century shiva sutras are in the 9th century this dualistic school is before that through the agamas and there were four pashupata siddhanta these are all now more or less not existing and and from the tantras later came shaktism so shakti that feminine energy of shiva was personified just like shiva was personified and then you had goddess shakti which then you had durga kali and all those goddesses including tara so um, now this becomes a dualistic kashmir dualistic shaivism and now we come to the non dualistic shaivism which is what we call and what we are studying kashmir shaivism and they come from the tantras that 9th century tantras which were discovered by vasugupta in a dream shiva came to him and said go and lift this rock and under the rock were inscribed the shiva sutra 77 aphorism 77 lines which were the sutras and then he had two disciples kalata who talked about vibration the treatise on vibration which explains about the contractions which create this world and the reverse contraction which take you back somananda was another disciple who wrote the entire philosophy of recognition pratibhijna that how do you go back to your recognizing your true self and their disciple his disciple utpala deva on a unified consciousness philosophy and now pto we go to the tantric schools proper tantric schools these were the teachers these were the teachers and they set up the philosophy the tantric school there were four sub schools kola krama spanda and tatvinya and so kola kula means family and these were this was the school which practice uh, sexual practices as part of the path so maybe it was family in the sense that it was a close knit group who knew about this secretly about those practices uh then krama is chronology or ordering number so different forms of kali and this was like stages of enlightenment sort of theory you know you come to this stage then you attain that stage then you go to the next stage and so on then there was the spanda school which concentrated mainly on the study of vibrations through yogic techniques and pratibhijna which was the recognition schools now today after that these four in the 10th century were integrated in those trika the three principles which we enunciated and this was by abhinava gupta in his main treatise tantra loka and a shorter summary tantra asara tantrasana so again to recap it's called the three because it discusses these three subjects like a tripod the nature of the absolute the nature of the human being and contraction the method by which contraction is overcome this quotation i like because it explains this whole idea of the world itself is shiva so it is not an enforced unity when we say that you know uh, india is unity in diversity 
we are not we are acknowledging the differences and then we are imposing a unicity unity on certain aspects over that so here he says unity is not mere negation of distinction but the absence of difference in diversity so what appears diverse is in fact not diverse it's the same thing the absence of difference in diversity so anyway this was the historical overview is that this Swami Shankarananda says that when I got exposed to Kashmir Shaivism, I finally realized what Aldous Huxley was talking about, uh, Satan, Sanatan Dharma, you know, when he wrote and perennial. Said, uh, sorry, perennial, perennial philosophy, yeah, perennial philosophy and or Sanatan Dharma. So that's a very short note. I'll share that screen also. And we can see how it will resonate, I think, even with us. So, so uh, forget this part. From here, in Huxley's 1944 essay in Vedanta in the West, he describes the minimum working hypothesis, like a minimum program, no minimum common program of political parties. The basic outline of the perennial philosophy found in all the mystic branches of the religions of the world. One, that there is a Godhead or ground or what we call substratum, which is the unmanifested principle of all manifestation. It is unmanifested, it's pure, it's absolute and is the principle of all manifestation, the reflection, contraction, whatever. That the ground is transcendent and immanent everywhere and transcendent. That it is possible for human beings to love know and become the ground. That to achieve this unity of knowledge, to realize this supreme identity, is the final end and purpose of human existence. That there is a law or dharma which must be obeyed, a tau or way which must be followed if humans are to achieve their final end. This, he says, is a common minimum thing. And then people superimpose the whole philosophical superstructure to explain how all this works. So you can now take these principles and straight away say, okay, how does Vedanta explain each of these five? How does uh, Madhyamika explain? How does Jainism explain? You know, it takes a little thinking and reflection, but it's not so difficult. And of course, there are books and books to read if one has to. Namashivaya satatam panchakritya vidhaine chidananda ganaswatma paramartha vibhasine. One can, Nama is, you know, salutation, Shiva is to Shiva. Satatam is uh, continuity, eternal. Panchakritya, five aspects, uh, five activities which the Shiva, Shiva undertakes. What are these five actions? Uh, creation, sustenance, destruction, contraction, and uh, compassion or anugraha is, uh, yeah, grace, vidhaine, who manifest, making manifest through these. Uh, so the Shiva is eternally making himself manifest through these five actions. Chidananda Ganaswatma, uh, the um, uh, Chidananda is Chit Ananda, the consciousness is bliss, ghanaswatma, ghana is mass of consciousness, swatma is the inner self or his self, martha is highest reality, vibhasine is how it projects itself. Uh, so the meaning is there, adoration to Shiva with who eternally brings forth about the five processes, who makes manifest the highest reality, which is the same time the highest value within each of us. Uh, okay, so let's just try and sing this. Shiva <laughs> Thank
ಅಚ್ಯುತಾನಂದ ಘನ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ವಿಭಾಸಿ ನಮ ಶಿವಾಯ ಸತತ ಪಂಚಕೃತ್ಯವಿಧಾಯಿನೆ ಚಿದಾನಂದಕನ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ವಿಭಾಸಿ ಚಿದಾನಂದ ಘನ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ವಿಭಾಸಿ ಚಿದಾನಂದ ಘನ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ವಿಭಾಸಿ ಚಿದಾನಂದ ಘನ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ವಿಭಾಸಿ ಪ್ರಕಾಶಮಾನೇ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥ ಭಾವ ನಶ್ಯ ವಿದ್ಯಾ ತಿಮಿರೇ ಸಮಸ್ತೆ ಸೊ ದ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಕಂಪೇರ್ ಟು ಸನ್ ಯು ನೋ ವೆನ್ ದ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಇಲ್ಯೂಮಿನೇಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆನ್ಸ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಾಯ್ಡ್ ತದಾ ಬುಧ ನಾವು ಬುಧ ಇಸ್ ಬುಧ ಬುಧ ವೈಸ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಇವನ್ ಇನ್ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ಬುಧ ಇಸ್ ಅವೈಕಣ್ಣ ನಿರ್ಮಲ್ ದೃಷ್ಟಿಯೋಪಿ ಕಿಂಚಿನ್ನ ಪಶ್ಯಂತಿ ಭವ ಪ್ರಪಂಚನ ಪ್ರಪಂಚ ಸೊ ವೆನ್ ದ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಇಲ್ಯೂಮಿನೇಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆನ್ಸ್ ಗೆಟ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಾಯ್ಡ್ then the wise person wise one of pure vision does not see the world of confusing multiplicity even to the smallest mind and the final one is in surrender which we are expected to do to shambhu sanadanadim ekam nirishtam bauda guha ಸರ್ವಾಲಯರಸ್ಥವ ಶಂಭು ಶರಣೇ ಶರಣ 
I take refuge in you alone, Shambhu, the transcendent, who are beyond the abyss, the beginningless one, the one who has entered many caves of heart. Bahuda Guhasu. Guha is uh, cave in Marathi. Yes. Nivishtam is residing. The abode of, uh, abode of all. Sarvalayam Sarva Charachara Saram. Sarva, chara, sarva is all. Charachara is whatever is a moving, sentient and non-sentient. Sarvalayam. Alay, we know. Himalay is the abode. Swami va Shambhum Sharanam Prapadde. You alone, Shambhu, I Saranam. I would suggest you go through this uh, recording and yeah, if you can spare about half an hour, you can actually get the feeling of being immersed in that sense of devotion.